The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And welcome to the City Council District 11 Democratic Primary Candidates Forum. This forum is a partnership between BronxNet Television and the Riverdale Press. I am Javier E. Gomez for BronxNet TV. And I'm Michael Hidman. I'm editor of the Riverdale Press. Today we come to you from the James Baldwin Outdoor Learning Center just outside of DeWitt Clinton High School. It's a community hub on West Moshaloo Parkway that features a community garden and has grown into a Saturday farmer's market, which is our backdrop for today's forum. NYC primary elections will take place on June 22nd. Early voting continues through June 20th. For those watching not familiar with the district, City Council District 11 includes the neighborhoods of Bedford Park, Kingsbridge, Riverdale, Norwood, Wakefield, and Woodlawn in the Northwest Bronx. This program today is not a debate. Instead, it's a forum, conversation, if you will, intended to bring together the candidates in person for the first time in this race. It's an opportunity to share their, their vision and the roadmap they will follow to implement it. We'll also focus on some current affairs impacting the community. So this is how it's going to work. Javi and I have put together five topic areas, public education, economic development, police, community relations, housing, and civics. We have a series of questions for each theme or segment to start up a conversation. Responses will not be timed, but candidates are encouraged to be considerate on how much time they're spending in this open conversation. We want to make sure that everyone has a chance to be heard. The conversation should remain collective. Each segment will last approximately 15 minutes. The participating Democratic primary candidates are, in alphabetical order, Eric Dinowitz, activist, former special ed teacher and incumbent council member for District 11, Mino Lora, artist, teacher, organizer, and an executive for a not-for-profit theater group, Abigail Martin, social worker, teacher, and advocate, Dan Paternak, attorney and community activist, former chair of Community Board 8, and Marcos Sierra, activist, not-for-profit worker, former member of Community Board 7. Another candidate, Carlton Berkeley, a retired police detective, wanted to join us today, but he is currently out of state uh, due to a family matter. Excellent, Javier. So uh, let's begin. Our first topic of conversation is public education. Um, we have no set order on who's going to begin each answer, but for this uh, particular question, since we do have a former educator here and our uh, current councilman, I wanted to start with Eric Dinowitz. As soon as I get to the page here, it's uh, kind of hard doing this outside. <laughs> so uh, you can see we're very high tech. Um, I, I just I wanted to get your thoughts, you know, as a as an educator and as a uh, councilman about the district's readiness for the mayor's recently announced back to school plan. And once Eric answers that, everybody else can also jump in as well. Sure. Thank you. You know, as you mentioned, I did teach in our public schools, a special education teacher, and I even taught here in the Bronx, here in the district. Um, I taught through the pandemic. And one of the challenges that I faced as a teacher that our students faced, that our families faced, was that we would we would find out on a Thursday that we were reopening on a Friday. We would find out on a Tuesday that we were closing down that day. We would be at faculty meetings and we would text around a picture of the TV screen telling us what the directives were in the school. Uh, the last minute decisions made it very hard for us teachers to plan and importantly for families to plan for child care and what type of uh, support and what type of support their children were going to get. And you know especially what I saw in, uh, teaching during the pandemic was the mental health impact and the toll this had on our children. The last minute decisions uh, made it very difficult for all of us. I, am, I was pleased, very pleased that it was announced last month that schools would be open five days a week because it would have our children in person for that social, emotional, academic support, but importantly, that it was happening months in advance. And right now, as councilmen, we are negotiating the budget, and we, we, we received a lot of money from the federal government stimulus from the state, and we can negotiate 
the money to have the smaller class sizes, to have the PP. And we have time now to discuss what does full-time reopening look like. Excellent. Everybody, and everybody else could jump in. This is an open question as well. So, I think as we as we think about what, how the district is prepared for coming back in person, communication has to be key. And with the mayor, between the mayor and the district and the teachers, I, as Eric said, that was completely working with so many principals, as I do with my organization. They were finding out that day through press conferences. But we need to make sure that we are not skipping out what is needed, right? We're going to be opening five days. That is best for the teachers. That is best for students students, most importantly, and for families. So how are we downsizing classrooms? How are we making sure that we are hiring more teachers? We can do that right away. How can we make sure that we are hiring more social workers and guidance counselors? Because as we come back from this year that has been so difficult, we need to make sure that not only think about the academic gap, but the social emotional, the trauma, uh, the trauma that, that students are going to be dealing with. And we need to be sure to be equipped for that. So we have the whole summer to prepare and we must be handling that straight on, working with our guidance counselors, working with our parent coordinators who know the needs of the school, know the needs of every family and with our principals. And I'd like to add that as a public school parent, I felt that the rollout this September firsthand, it was awful. We didn't know when yeah. our kids were, when school was gonna start. I have friends who are teachers, they got moved around from one district to the other. Our concerns about the inequities, which we already knew existed in the Department of Education, have really come true. And so for the first time ever, New York City schools are going to have be fully funded. And we need to ensure, and I will ensure as city council member, that this funding goes to where it's needed most. We need to ensure our multilingual learners are getting the support that they need because they haven't been. We know there's a lawsuit about that right now. We need to ensure that our exceptional learners are getting the support that they need. We need programs to help students who have fallen behind get caught up. We need to bring down the class sizes, 32, 35 students to a class. It's way too big. So education is one of my top priorities and I'm really looking forward to getting in there and, in and holding the Department of Education accountable so that they serve our children in New York City better. You know, and Dan, since we're, I mean, we're kind of going down here, it seems like an order. Yeah. You know, as you're, as you're thinking about this, I want you to also kind of think about also what are some of the priorities that, that schools should be facing as we're getting back from this uh, post-pandemic world? You know, what are some of the priorities as well? Yeah, no, excellent question. And just, you know, following up, the original was, you know, the planning part of it, right? So I went to PS95. I went to JHS 143. I know what it was like to go through the public school system. I still teach mock trial in one of the public schools here uh, as well. Planning is extremely important to families. You know, communication to families is extremely important. What I saw through the course of the pandemic was really poor communication from the mayor's office, from City Hall, from our elected officials. There always seemed to be a mixed message and there seemed to be fighting. You know, you had dysfunctional politics going on back and forth. And then you added fighting between the teachers union and City Hall, which, again, added to the problem. We can't have that again, not going into to September. I am extremely excited to see that, you know, we have stated kids are going back to school five days a week. Um, priorities with kids back in school five days a week. Quite a few kids got left behind at home. I mean, let's be frank. So one of the priorities, especially this summer, is going to be identifying those children and identifying the needs that they have. Who is really behind in their studies right now? Um, and what resources do they need? And what extra resources do they need? Um, we mentioned federal funding. We mentioned a lot of you know, additional funding. I think it's extremely important for our city council, more than ever right now, to look to see where that money is going. I do not want to see it squandered and wasted. And part of that's going to be improving the infrastructure. It's going to be reducing class size. We have an opportunity right now, coming out of the pandemic, to restructure the way we educate our children. And, and we need, as council members, to do that and be involved in the conversation, following up on our agencies and not letting them go. We need to hold their feet to the fire on a host of different issues. Um, but, um, you know, I don't yeah, want to well, take I mean, Marcos, what do you think about priorities and such as well? Well, I think it's, it's great that we are opening up um, the school five days a week, right? Because as we know, even prior to the pandemic, um, public school children were, 50% of them were below grade level. Um, and this pandemic has um, exacerbated and, and exposed that um, and has actually made it even worse. Um, so going back to school as a parent of an eight-year-old, right, who, who has just recently gone back to school, I see the difference um, in how she's learning and, 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 and how she's completing her work. Um, so it's important that we have the proper funding. Um, reducing class sizes is, is, 
should be top priority because less teacher, uh, less students allow the teachers to give a more focused, uh, more focused attention to those students that are kind of like behind. Um, but we also have to provide the, the support for the teachers, right? Because we, we talk often about the trauma that the children are experiencing, but the teachers have experienced the trauma as well and this mass miscommunication from the DOE and the principals and stuff like that. And lastly, uh, we need to reinvest, uh, we need to put a priority in reinvesting in our after school programs. Um, I was a, a beneficiary of an after school program. Um, it, it gave me a fascinating, a fascination behind math and science through playing pool. Um, and, and we need to go back to that, right? We need to help our children and ensure that the, 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 the field is level for all of them throughout the entire district. You know, I think of all the of all the candidates, it, it, Marcus. You're not too far from here either. But Dan, I know you you live pretty close to where we're at here at Clinton High School. Um, recently, you know, there's been some like exactly where we're at here right now in the James Baldwin Outdoor Learning Center. Uh, there has there's been a situation where uh, the principals of the school and the DOE has decided to evict the James Baldwin um, Learning Center, the Outdoor Learning Center here. It doesn't affect the Saturday market, at least so far, but but it does affect this garden that, that many people have spent years working on, and it's been a wonderful part of where we're at here. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Is there anything that, that the city can do to kind of intervene, or should they even intervene? Is this even an issue for them? Absolutely, the city should, should intervene. Um, the James uh, Baldwin Outdoor Learning Center it, it is an absolute... Um, a, amazing program and what they do with, with children of, of the area, of the school, it, it, and just the, the concept of it in, in general it, is amazing. So yes, um, one, I think it's extremely horrible what the, what the administration did here. On very little notice, they told these folks, you know, after years of hard work and after years of teaching students here at the, at the JBOLC, that they had to leave pretty much right away. Um, I, I think one of the root issues there, one of the root problems that we see is essentially the transparency within the Department of Education, and, or I should say the lack of transparency within the Department of Education. And the other issue that's popping up out of there is the decision-making ability. You know, we have a program that they're using a good amount of space here, and you have, you know, a school with four different principals, essentially, who got together in, in, in a private meeting and decided that they're going to get rid of the garden. There was no community input. There was no transparency on it, and there was no opportunity for the community to come in and weigh in on that decision making. So that process needs to change as well. It's through one of the directives of the Department of Education. That directive needs to change. What should happen now? You know, current elected officials should be right now hounding the commissioner of the Department of Education, or the chancellor rather, of the Department of Education, and every single day finding out why this garden isn't coming back. And that's what needs to happen. Everybody else could jump in, by the way. Yeah, I. I, I agree that the city should intervene, and that's why I've intervened. You know, there was a plan to evict them. They were going to be evicted, I believe, in May, and they are not because I intervened, because I know the value of gardening and outdoor education, because I taught environmental science. I saw the impact it had on our children firsthand. So this is something that was very important to, to, to me in, in, in my experience as a teacher. Can we and get clarification on that? And they uh, have been evicted. They have right? been evicted. No, they, they, that is on pause. They have not been evicted. What is happening now, and I know because what I did was I brought the principals together. I brought community members together. I brought the James Baldwin Outdoor Learning Center together. It was on Zoom. What's happening now is they, the, the, the permit process for this particular portion is they're, they're waiting to get the permit done. The, the, the DOE is not currently issuing permits, and I am working to get them a permit. Because the garden is, I'm sorry, the, the farmer's market is affected. The selling of food and community activities here is not affected. But over there, we had parents teaching their kids to, I saw toddlers learning how to walk. I saw community activists or community members playing music and doing arts and crafts with children. And it has been affected. So I am involved in trying to save the garden. Again, they were going to be evicted. They were asked to remove everything by a certain date. That has been revoked. And we are in the process of saving the garden. That is what we were doing. And you spoke before about priorities, and I just want to bring it back to that. Because one of the incredible things that we see in outdoor education, again, is the impact it has on the children, the positive impact it has on them, uh, even the food justice component. When children see uh, the way their food is grown, that that impacts their health, and they, are light, they, and they are eating healthy for the rest of their lives. And so taking it back to priorities, what we've seen during the pandemic is that, you know what, high stakes tests, are not that important for every child. 
It is not that important for every single child to sit in the desk with a textbook in front of them and repeat after the teacher. What is important are the experiences our children have, and these high-stake tests very often disincentivize our schools and our teachers from engaging our children in those activities. Abigail, you want so, to jump in yeah, on that? Yeah, I'd like to jump in here. So, Eric, I'm, I'm so glad to hear you, you've gotten involved. Um, so do you know what the holdup is with the permit process? Because we're in prime gardening season right now. And while they might not have been evicted to the sense that they have to move their stuff, equipment out of the garden, they can't access the garden. So right now we're losing prime time. What's the holdup with the permitting why, why can't the Department of Education issue that permit? Because the, the Department of Education, they are not, uh, apparently they are not issuing permits. But the point is that I'm getting involved because this is so important. They've closed the garden down. And what they said, until we work something out, um, there's, there's no access to the garden. But what they are, so, suppo what they are supposed to be so let me follow well, up well, there because, because you're saying they weren't evicted and and let's and again let's just be clarity because this is supposed to be a fairly thing. Is just, no, Eric, I'd love to finish. But, Eric, give him a moment. But let's give clarity you, you because I think people should, you know, understand what's really happening. We said that they were evicted. They were. Right now the kids can't get into the James Baldwin Outdoor Learning Center. To me that's evicted. The fact that the school hasn't thrown out their stuff yet it, it, and they and they're waiting to throw out their stuff doesn't mean they haven't been thrown out. They can't use the center right now. If the kids wanted to come in and garden right now, they can't do that. That, to me, says they were evicted. So first of all, what you're suggesting is that as council member, I have a magic wand and can get rid no, of the No, what I'm suggesting Dan, is I'm we tell the, the truth. Of, of replying. So here's It's the not truth. a magic wand. And I understand government better than you do. But please, let, let's, get, let's be clear about this. We said that the kids were not allowed to use this. We said they were evicted. You said, no, they weren't evicted. I stopped that. They revoked the eviction. They didn't do that. They just held off on throwing away their stuff. Let's be clear. Thank you for that reply, Dan. That very respectful the reply. Truth. It was the truth. Here is the Let's truth. Be truthful. The truth is right now, the members of the school, the teachers, are supposed to be working with Ray to, 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 to work towards a solution. That is not an eviction. They are not being, if you'd like to interrupt me again, please, by all means, but I'm trying to reply to your question. And have a conversation. So let's this have is a what conversation. This is supposed to be. Yes, let's and have a conversation. conversation includes listening. Would you like to listen or just interrupt me? All right, well, I no, what I would like to do is actually make sure people understand the truth. Right now, if kids can't go into the garden, that means they have been evicted. If they can't use it, it means they have been evicted. If if somebody is evicted from their apartment and they can't go back in or you know, or locked out of their apartment by knowing, you know, they can't go back in. That is an eviction. That is an eviction, right? All right. If they can't go well, back I in, mean, let's just be honest about it. This is something, okay? this is, by the so way, that this way is, people are clear. No, that's and fine. again, I by appreciate the way, what thing, you're doing. Me, uh, just one thing to, I, just to add. So, as councilwoman, for me, it is essential. I will bring the same skills of the same work that I have been doing with my organization, right? It's building and engaging with all different stakeholders, it's listening, it's understanding. Having meetings with the principal, understanding why. Why did that happen? What led you to that decision? Speaking with Ray, speaking with the James Balding Outlaw Learning Center, understanding why, speaking to the students, coming together and sharing that with the community, right? So it's about transparency, it's about engaging stakeholders and being open and finding that solution moving forward. So to be clear, and I, I appreciate that response because that is exactly what we're doing. And I'll just repeat, when we found out about the eviction, we were on it right away. He is not being, he is not, the, the, the James Baldwin Outdoor Learning Center, which runs the garden, is not being asked to immediately leave. Whether children and teachers have access to the garden, it is not true that it is locked. Teachers and children from the school have access to it. What we are working out now, and it doesn't immediately happen. It doesn't happen with a magic wand. It doesn't happen right away. It happens just as you said, by bringing people together and working out whatever problems existed. And that is, as council member, what I am trying to do. Because again, this is so vital. This education is so vital for our children and our community. And you didn't see it, but one of the women who engaged in those community activities, getting kids to color, reading to them during story time, just walked by. And now she can't do it because, because of the permits not being um, allowed right there. That we are trying, that we are working hard to, to do. I think this issue highlights, we're all talking about this, we're all in agreement of this, the Department of Education is not transparent. That needs to change. It impacts parents, it impacts teachers, it impacts schools. We need more transparency in the Department of Education period across all issues. And more project-based learning. 
more progressive schools in our district. That needs to be a priority. Interestingly, one of these schools is a project-based learning school, and we hear excellent, wonderful things. And again, that goes back to moving away from high-stakes tests for every child and engaging in that project-based learning and things that actually positively impact our children and well, their families. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you, everybody, on that. I, I was able to get three whole questions in there, Javier, as we move on to our next theme. There's a lot to talk about, absolutely. Now, our time, uh, our time is up on education, so let's turn our attention to economic development. Let's start with the mom-and-pop shops in the district. Um, they're going through a crisis of a very different nature, the pandemic, high rents, the, 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 the automation of retail, uh, everything seems to be changing. Um, starting with rents, uh, do you support any form of uh, commercial rent control? Yes. 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 Any it's, thoughts? Can you elaborate on that, please? One of the, one of the uh, biggest costs, right, for, for staying in business, for small businesses, um, is rent. I have uh, a merchant I was talking to uh, just yesterday, and they had to pay $16,000, $16,000 in rent. But the foot traffic has, you know, reduced by about two thirds. Um, this is a major store right here on, on Gun Hill Road. Um, and it's unconscionable, right, for, for us to expect our small businesses to pay such a high rent um, when their income is, is not equal. So we have to, there's two things that we can do. Actually, we can uh, give tax breaks to the landlords which then will trickle down, and I use that term very loosely because trickle down economics doesn't work, um, but it should, in theory, um, you know, pass down, those savings should pass down to the small business owner, and then we could also implement a form of um, rent stabilization um, to ensure that rents aren't going up by 10 or 20% for our small business owners. When I launched my campaign, I launched it with a small business tour. I started it last August, and I started it in Bedford Park. And I did that because I found out that only 1% of Bronx-based businesses had received any sort of P um, financial support from the first round of PPP, and I wanted to find out why. And what I learned was, was what I thought, was that we have a huge digital divide with our mom and pop business owners. We have a huge communication barriers. There's language barriers there. There's, there's technology issues there. And we need to support our businesses. They were hurting long before COVID because of Amazon and big box stores. And COVID, for many of them, was just the nail on the coffin. Often. Our small businesses support over or employ over 50% of our private workforce. We need to figure out a way to support these businesses. We have money coming to them. We need to get it to the ones that support it most. And I have an idea of partnering with Lehman College and the business majors there and, and um, creating a mentorship program where we have business students that go out into the community and mentor our mom and pop businesses, help them get on social media, help them with their digital divide, with the technology, help them pivot. The businesses that could pivot are the ones that survived this pandemic and the ones that didn't are barely getting by. I support commercial rent stabilization, and I disagree with Marcos about giving tax uh, breaks for the landlords and the trickle down. For me, it's actually the opposite. We need to tax, we, we need a commercial vacancy tax, right? So what does that mean? We need to actually tax them if it's vacant, because some businesses have unfortunately not been able to survive during this time. We need to make sure that they can go back. How do we do that? We make sure that we are lowering the rent and we can do what we can to do that. One thing is passing this tax, right? So that they are taxed if it's empty, which means it incentivizes them to lower the rent so small businesses can be there. And I agree with Abigail. We need to support them with all of this process. I started a business. It's a nonprofit, right? So I incorporated a 501c3, but it is a small business and it takes a lot of work. And I've dealt with growing a nonprofit organization to where it's at today, a million dollars. There's a lot of bureaucracy. Right When you're applying for grants, or you're applying for loans from the city, from the state, from the federal government, for small businesses who have, have a staff of one or two, which is what we were for many years, mm -hmm. my goodness, there's such literacy, right, that we need to be engaging. And as councilwoman, this is something that I will do. I will make sure that we will have small business support right there in our office, multilingually. We're able to do it to meet all, not only in Espanol, claro, pero in Bangla, right, in French, in all of the various languages spoken here in our district, because it's not only that the funding needs to be there, but it needs to be accessible. And sometimes online is not the way, right? We need to be culturally responsive. So how are we engaging? We're supporting them in applying right there and being that vehicle and that channel. So we speak, speak a lot about language access, and I couldn't agree more. We talk a lot about English and Spanish, but as was mentioned, there are a lot of other languages. 
and I'm proud that each one of my staff members speaks a different second language. And a lot of my work as council member has been about reaching out to businesses, canvassing the businesses in the different languages that they speak. In my campaign, we speak about a dozen languages, and we are doing that very specific, deliberate outreach in the different in different languages to make to build the relationships between businesses and their elected officials, and 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 leverage those. By the way, leverage those relationships that they have with their with their customers, with their loyal customers, to to get them vaccinated. Right? We talk about small businesses increasing foot traffic. People need to be vaccinated so it is safe to go in and out of stores again. And so, we're, and so I organized a vaccine giveaway, a vaccine site today and yesterday. But before we just set up the vaccine site, we canvassed the different businesses in multiple languages. We sent out flyers in multiple languages, talked to business owners in multiple languages. Because, you know, you may not trust the PSA on TV. But maybe you trust the person who's selling you pizza or shawarma or, or doing your hair or, or providing your prescription medication. So there's language access, leveraging that trust uh, between the businesses uh, and residents in order to get us vaccinated so that we can have more foot traffic and, and really revitalize our small businesses by getting more customers in and out the door. In terms of economic, oh. yeah. in terms of economic development, um, what are some of the projects that you uh, are already envisioning if elected? One of the one of the projects that I would like to um, bring to the Northwest Bronx, right? Um, there's Sobro. It's a it's a, a not for profit that helps businesses and small entrepreneurs get off the ground. That's how I started my business, um, and I do know that we have a do uh, a business program at Lehman College, but it's not really accessible, right? Not very, not not too many people know about it. So as a, as to help build economic development, I want to bring a business incubator to the Northwest Bronx. I started my business with 10 cups of flan and one store, right? I ended up in 30 stores from Gun Hill all the way to Yankee Stadium, and that was because I had access to this program. I'm not the only one in the North Bronx with an idea for a business that can, and I've kept it local. Um, so I want to bring in those types of business incubators to give people in the North Bronx the opportunity to flesh out an idea that could potentially uh, change their lives. So yeah, and uh, you know, we, we talk about fleshing out ideas. You know, this goes back. I know we're done with education, but it goes back to how we are educating our children and what we're teaching them. I talk a lot about high stakes tests not being for every child. And one of the things that I talk about is, you know, what if instead of a high stakes test at the end of the year, a student did, um, you know, an internship or, or worked with with a union or a small business development, got some sort of real world, real world experience. And that was what teachers were incentivized to, to do with their students. That's what students were incentivized to work for. So workforce development, things like that, can start in our schools, but our schools are not incentivized to do it. Economic development uh, in the city of New York, you know, th there's a lot of different drivers for it, and we need to look at it from all different sectors. Quite frankly, in my opinion, we need to start a lot of economic fires within the various industries uh, at a very hyper-local level, which is where, where we can really have an effect. It's it's small stores. We were trying to talking about that, and I didn't, I didn't get a chance. But this will this will go into it. Right now, our businesses have been hurting. Small businesses are critical to every community, not just for for the local goods and services that they provide, but the atmosphere of a community and, and public safety of a community as well. You don't want vacant storefronts out there. So you know, small businesses. As a city council member, you spoke about taxes. Yes. Many businesses through their lease have to pay taxes, so I would look for abatements for small businesses. Water as well. Many small businesses are paying for their own water. I'd look to help struggling businesses with that as well. Provide them w with grants for outdoor spaces because, quite frankly, I think a lot of those outdoor spaces should stay for good in many places because I think it adds to the community. O on a bigger level from the city, I think what we need to look for uh, is development and, and the type of development that's out there. I I'm a strong proponent of limited equity cooperatives, much like the Mitchell-Lama program, uh, much like HDFCs. I think you know creating affordable housing that lasts for generations is what we need to do, and that's a huge economic driver. You know, um, and it's also a good source of good jobs for unions who I think should be building many of these new properties, and that's another economic driver that's there. Essentially, as a city council member, we need to look at what's going on in the different industries and, and make sure that we're supporting 
all of those different industries, whether it's a small business, the, the development, making sure the jobs gets to the right places uh, and the right homes, um, and anything we can to, to support business and generate economic and activity. We and cannot, I, we cannot talk about economic development without talking about child care and the cost of child care yes. in this city. Only one out of three families in District 11 can afford ch center-based child care. It is too expensive. When I had my twins, I had to leave the full-time workforce because we couldn't afford childcare for two babies. And small business owners are in home daycares, and many of them are women of color. And when I talk about being a social worker who understands the complicated and bureaucratic systems in New York City, I understand that we've got ACS and the Administration for Children's Services and the Department of Education involved right now in how childcare works, and it's a bureaucratic nightmare. And I have talked to family after family in this district that has applied for the childcare subsidy, and they can't get in. This is a feminist issue. This is a, a working families issue, and we have to get a handle on how child care works in this city if we're going to move this city forward to be just and equitable for all of us. Yes. Yeah. Just to say, it is very much an economic issue. We can't go back to work if we don't have our loved ones staying safe. So I support, and I think we have to invest in universal child care, subsidized child care, and elder care, right? So it's all of our loved ones, those that need support. Um, in addition to that, as we build economic development, it is supporting our small businesses with commercial lease assistance and subsidizing. Uh, but it's also about making sure uh, that we have a municipal jobs training program, as I have in my platform, right? We need to be building a green economy we need to be leading that effort. We have bills that we pass. We now need to implement them. So uh, as we build workforce development, we are investing in creating new prevailing wage jobs, union jobs, and starting some of that training in high school, right? Making sure that CUNY is free. So for those that college is their path, we are able to do that. It was free. It should be free again. All of this creates economic development. Now is the time for New York City to invest, invest in our people, invest in our families, invest in small businesses, create the jobs so that at the end of these two years when the federal funding and you know we may not have that what we have now, we have built it up. We have trained new workforce, black and brown and Latino, those that have been impacted by the systemic racism, the redlining, as, uh, as Dan was saying, right? How are we creating paths to home ownerships? Yes, HDFC, yes, Michelama, these programs, and also expand Home First, right? Grants for first-time home buyers, making sure that our real estate um, brokers, you know, I have a plan to make sure that they all do anti-racist, anti-bias training, right? Whether it's for rentals or it's for home ownerships, because for far too long, we have seen how black communities and our brown communities are taken away from this. This is part of building wealth. This is part of economic development and stability for our families here in New York. Yeah, I, I just like to add, you know, two things. One is, yes, about the child care. When my wife and I, when she, when, when we had our twins one day before yours, <laughs> that, that was a decision. It's true. But that was a decision that um, that we made was that it was cheaper for it was more economically viable for her to be with the children um, than to send them to childcare, just from a purely financial perspective. I also don't want to lose uh, sight of the fact that when we talk about small businesses, yes, we are talking about the owners, their employees, but we're also talking about our communities. Now, nobody likes to see vacant storefronts, but I think specifically of our older adults and people with disabilities who may rely on our local businesses much more than people who would be able to, to, to drive somewhere or go online and order something online. It is vital for our entire communities to make sure that, that we have and are supporting our small businesses. We only so, have about four minutes in I, I, this I, segment. Yeah, just as a point of information, you know, right now, you know, there is a voucher program out there for childcare, you know, um, to get into certain daycare centers, and that they do accept these vouchers like all over the city. And that's a program that, you know, as as a city council member, I would want to expand and make sure that families know of. Um, so that's what I, it's I was an important about. aspect. And it's an and it's an administrative the, nightmare. Well, yeah, we definitely uh, have to. to I have a little, yeah. Well, no, I, I actually know some of the businesses that work with these vouchers, and, yes. and it's a great program, especially for the families that have It's a great program if you yes. can get it, but what happened was it used to be under the Administration for Children's Services, then they tried to change it to the Department of Education, so now the Department of Education as part of it, and the ACS still needs to approve yeah. the families. The, it's a nightmare. I believe this one is through HRA and DOH, the, the one that I'm thinking of. I think the fact that you're having this conversation yeah. speaks to yeah. exactly to the problem we have. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It definitely needs to be expanded because I have a friend who just 
right, got into the program, um, and she had to take her child all the way to Manhattan. So we need more yeah. programs, more vendors in the programs yeah. that are in the neighborhoods that they're needed. Home-based child care. In, and in the last three minutes approximately that we have in this uh, segment, uh, transportation is key to economic development. Is there anything on your radar regarding uh, transportation, alternative methods of transportation, underserved areas? Oh, certainly, yeah. certainly buses, increasing the, the, you know, the bus service and making sure the technology is there uh, for all door boarding, you know, controlling the, the traffic signals. Because here in the Bronx, that is a huge part of how we get around, how we get from the West Bronx to the East Bronx or how we get to the train. Good. We only have two more minutes. Anyone else wants to comment on that? I believe we should implement um, something similar that they're doing in, in District 12 um, with electric scooters. Um, you know, it's hard to travel around, travel around in Riverdale. There's no express bus. And I know there's a lot of seniors, but there's also a lot of young people. So we need to bring alternative methods like e-scooters into the neighborhood that will help our younger people, um, you know, stay out of cars. Accessibility for seniors and, 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 and the disabled community. Absolutely. 1,000%. We need to work on accessibility. And, you know... I, I, uh, I love alternate modes of transportation. You know, I think e-bikes can be useful, but we have to figure out the safety of folks as well. And, and you know, again, if we're seeing some scooters on sidewalks, we, we need to kind of, as city council members, figure out how to get the scooters on onto the roadway in a safe way. And I'd love to see a program where we have a bus in District 11 that will pick up our older adults and take them to some of the gems that we have here, the Oval, the Woodlawn Cemetery, the Van Cortland Park. Parts of this district are incredibly hilly, and it's really hard for our older adults or adults who or adults with mobility issues to get around. Let's get a bus and go around <laughs> on the weekends and get people out of their homes and enjoying the parks that we have. Yes, efficient buses, uh, green buses, and paths that make them be more faster going from east to west, as we know in the Bronx is a big thing. Um, and, and also, as we're thinking about bike lanes and alternative modes of transportation, it can't just be uh, talking about the lanes, but how are we making bikes accessible? How are we doing bike education in schools? Not to out him, but my good friend grew up right here in the Bronx, and he doesn't know how to ride a bike. So, you know, he Who's is 40 that? years old. We Who's need that? to make sure. I'm not going to say his oh, name. He will tell me. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I don't no know. Nobody is here. Nobody here. Yeah. Daniel, don't worry. Um, I've done a century. So, I mean, come on. But it's like we need to make sure. We need to make sure that as we're talking about bikes, we make them. Are we doing bikes in school? Make that part of, you know, PE. Make sure that we're making them affordable. Make sure that we have bike parking in schools so that it is not only a bike lane that's never used or used for some, but it really is accessible for yeah, all. We, we actually brought up. Oh. I'm glad you brought up bike parking in school because sometimes it's 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 those little <laughs> things, right? I remember I had a student who wanted to bike to school. They didn't want it. They, they didn't let him. There was no place for him to, to lock his bike. So I had to go down and meet him downstairs every day and take his bike upstairs and leave it in my classroom. And what a disincentive to, to biking to school. So, and sometimes it is the little things, those bike lockers or those bike parkings at our schools that will allow our students to bike to school. Well, thank Look, you, guys. I think we should have bike storage in your subways as well. And well, create certain like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that we solved all the economic development issues in 15 minutes. <laughs> yes. So congratulations on all of that. So I, I want us to kind of jump um, to some, you know, to, to to another very serious topic. It's been very serious, especially you know over the past year, but it's been longer than that. But it's been kind of in the forefront, and that's talking about police community relations. Uh, the biggest aspect of this, you know, that uh, seems like it's coming up a lot is the CCRB. The um, and, you know, and I knew I was going to have to say what it was. So, <laughs> and it's like I'm civilian old. complaint review board. Yeah, so it's, yeah it's, I don't know. It was it was right there. But I mean, so there's been a lot of question about the powers that this board has. That you know that you know that they can they can recommend discipline, but it's not mandatory. The police chief can do without with what he will. Um, you know, Mino, you know, I know that you know that there's been some controversy. You know, with you, you know, not too long ago in terms of you know when what happened with the protests and such last year and and thoughts on police. You know, um. And I know that you probably, you know, there's, I know that you have thoughts about there should be change or somewhat. I mean, how do you think that can happen at the CCRB level? Like, what should happen with the CCRB? So the Civilian Complaint Review Board, about half of the recommendations they made were not put into effect, right? So we need to make sure that they are more than an advisory, right? This is a case for a lot of things in our city. When we have civilians making decisions, they need to be heard. Right. So the commissioner should be fired. The commissioner abused protesters. The commissioner didn't follow through. We need to keep our police accountable. We need to make sure to correct their scope of responsibilities. We need them to focus on violent crime, on hate crimes. We need them to be walking around building those relationships, not in a car. 
We don't need them to be when a, a New Yorker with mental health crisis calls. We don't need them to be the one who answers, right? We need to have higher, more social workers, higher, more healthcare professionals, right? That will help build relationships with our police. They are important and we need them and they have a job that they need to do. We have expanded what that is and that is unfair to them. It is unfair to our community. As we, as we build these relationships, after school programs, youth development, investing in restorative justice in our schools, in reintegration programs, making sure that we have the possibilities. We have seen an unbelievable increase in crime this last year. That is a fact, right? This year, we have also seen the impacts that COVID has had in food insecurity, in housing insecurity, in lack of health care. So as we address and focus the police on what they need to do and what we need them to do, focus on violent crime, focus on hate crimes, we need to make sure that we are also addressing housing needs. Every New Yorker, every Bronx like, should be housed, should have a home, should have food at their table, shouldn't have to negotiate between feeding their children and paying their rent, okay, and should have get, access to health care. I don't want to get too far off topic here, though. Yeah. So, yeah. Abigail, you want to jump sure, in Sure, thank you. I'm the only candidate here that has has experience working with the police and in the criminal system. That's I not have true. Carlton's not here. <laughs> I, you, you can, all right. Um, I have worked alongside NYPD detectives in child abuse investigations. We have worked together to conduct child abuse investigations. I've also worked to advocate for reduced sentences for youth who have been arrested. If you want somebody to address the issues within the police department, you want somebody that has seen it from the inside, and I have. I believe we need to build a new relationship with the police, one based on accountability, transparency, collaboration, and unity. The bottom line is we cannot have economic prosperity in this city if we don't have public safety. We need to have zero tolerance for abuse of power within the police department, and we need to strategically fund the police so that we're funding what works, we're not funding what doesn't, and we are prioritizing public safety. The other day I was talking to a woman in Van Cortlandt Village who was crying because she had to go to take the subway to go to a doctor's appointment downtown. She didn't have enough money to take the cab and she was terrified to take the subway. The, the crime that's on the rise here is, is no joke. People are scared. I am on the phones, I am at the doors. Everybody is talking about the increase of crime. We need to figure out a way to build relationships, renew the relationship between the police and the people and work together for safer streets. Well, Marcos, well, I mean, uh, Marcos, just really quick. I mean, we're talking about subway crime, but I mean, that's, but, you know, but a lot of that is more handled by, you know, by state, you know, by state MTA control police. How do you, how do you bridge the gap between what's happening with the MTA police, what's happening with the city police in terms of trying to make public transit safer? Well, that's a, we have to build relationships, right? There's a, there's a, there's a big distrust of the, t the intentions of police officers when, when dealing with people of color, right? No matter where you are, whether you're on the subway, walking while black, driving while black, whatever the case may be. Um, we have to find a way to, to have critical conversations with, with, with our police officers, right? With the brass um, at, at the NYPD so that they can understand and know um, what it's like for us to walk in these, in, in, in these neighborhoods and be harassed. We have to re, um, remove qualified immunity, right? Qualified immunity is what gives police officers a shield to do these heinous acts against uh, innocent civilians. Um, and, and I believe that if we take away this, this shield of protection, they'll be less likely to, to be more, to be as aggressive as they are and will be more likely to want to wanna have that dialogue because they know they're gonna be held accountable for any um, you know, disproportionate interaction that they may have. So one, let's remove qualified immunity. Two, let's truly have critical conversations with the NYPD and the MTA so that they can understand what it's like to be black in this neighborhood. So, you know, I, look, I think as a candidate, facts are important and make sure that we're conveying accurate information out to the public. And, and you know, sometimes I get excited doing that. So, yeah, you know, Carlton, not here, but Carlton was obviously former NYPD, but also on the community board. You know, we deal with the police department um, it, on board eight. We've dealt with the 50th or I've dealt with the 50th for the last 12 years uh, on a ton of different issues. Uh, I mean, each week there's some sort of public safety issue coming up that, that comes through my committee that we have to deal with the local police precinct. We're, we're talking about, you know, 
uh, regular problems that come up as board chair, I was frequently speaking to the, the CEO of the 50th on a host of different matters. So we, we do have to work with the police department, you know, in the local community and as council members, and it's a host of issues. And you want to have a rapport with your local precinct. You, you have to have that in order to get anything done. I've made it a priority to go to police precinct council meetings. Now, we talk about accountability. There must be accountability within the NYPD. There must be reform within the NYPD. But we have to identify the problems that are going on there. But, Dan, um, do you think that, I mean, you know, being in and, the 50th Precinct, which isn't yeah. exactly, you know, the, the, the highest crime. I mean, it's actually some of the lowest crime, you know, in the Bronx. Correct. Or the part it, of the it, city. Yep. But do you think that, I mean, do you think that sometimes that, that, that you know, that, that creates a situation where a lot of us are blind to, to what might be happening in other precincts, in the relationships that's happening, you know, the, the crime that's happening, how to control that, that because it's Definitely. not so bad so, here. So it's more absolutely, it's a, it's a fantastic point. You know, he, in the west side of this district is a much safer area than on the eastern side of the district. When you look at the stats of what's going on, the 5-2 and the 4-7 are much more active than the 5-0. Uh, when you go to the 5-2 precinct council meetings, you're hearing a, a lot more activity of what's happening. So you have to be cognizant of it and being in the community. You, you, you would know that if you're like on, on the ground. W within the NYPD, we have to understand what's happening wi within the department as well. Um, and quite frankly, I think we have to identify that a lot of officers are suffering from PTSD. A lot of them are seeing you know, horrible things on a daily basis that, you know, they have to bring home. And we have to address that if we're going to reform the NYPD. Um, in, in terms of the, the types of acts and what the NYPD should be doing, look, I, I look at things very practically. And, and I would love to see some of these programs. And I think we should fund a lot of restorative programs. And we should look at pilot programs where we are having um, you know, mental health professionals engage with NYPD, but we have to be realistic about the danger that is out there. When folks talk about, you know, traffic stops, it's extremely dangerous for a police officer to, to walk up to a car when they don't know what's there. And we have to be practical about it. So I don't support having DOT do that type of thing because it's dangerous activity. At the same time, we have to change certain cultures within the NYPD. And I love when Carlton Berkeley speaks about it because he speaks with such experience and, and with such heart. Um, and that's the type of conversations we need to be doing. The original question was civilian complaint review board, right? And I want to get back to that. What powers should this board really have? You know, it, it's advisory right now. If you do want to give this board some teeth, uh, I think we have to kind of structure the way uh, those members are chosen, the experience of the members that are going to be there. Um, and if we're going to give them teeth, then it has to, you know, be in a form. And again, you're looking at due process, right? Because now you're talking uh, uh, about a lot of those issues that come into play. That needs to be restructured as well. Um, I would support giving a little bit more power to the CCRB if we change the structure of the CCRB. Eric, um, one thing I wanted to talk to you about, uh, we've had a lot of discussion lately, and uh, and rightfully so, because it's very important about hate crime and such. And, you know, we've seen, you know, we've seen a lot of focus on, um, you know, anti-Semitism, especially racial. Uh, but there's another area that I think sometimes gets overlooked. And, um, you know, and that's our uh, city's transgender population. Um, you know, I, I don't know how accurate the stats are, but the life expectancy of, you know, of many of our, our transgender neighbors is very low. Um, you know, that they're, they're regularly attacked. A lot of them could be killed and murdered, you know, killed. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just it's one of those very difficult things. I mean, what is a you know, as, as someone who's serving a city council, who's who's looking at uh, working with the police and building that, what are ways of, of, of addressing that as well? Like where it's not just anti-Semitism, it's not just race, but it's also, you know, with, this is a very vulnerable community. Yeah, and you know, certainly do want to highlight that there there really is a, a, you know racist problems, anti-Semitic problems, anti-Asian problems. The, these all exist, and I want to name them because because they are important. But there's also anti-LGBTQ uh, violence. You know, as a teacher, I, I remember um, you know one of my students uh, identified as male in the classroom, but had to identify as female at home because that's what you know that's how he was accepted at home. And that kind of that kind of you know mental health trauma does a lot to a child. That is very that I, we can't describe the, the impact that had on the child. Most of my interactions with him were not academic. It was social emotional support that I was providing because of that. And so that is why in the in the budget we are pushing for uh, more more mental health facilities in the school or funding for those mental health facilities in the school to provide that support for anyone who needs it. I am I, using my discretionary funds supporting uh, supporting mental health dollars for mental health support. I've already uh, coordinated with different community groups and junior high schools and high schools going into schools 
and teaching anti-hate education, just as I did as a teacher, um, designing those anti-hate programs, going into schools and, and doing that, because we need to get to the root causes of this violence, which is, which is to teach that, we, that there are differences and we should celebrate those differences and, and learn about them. But there's also the reality that we need safety in the moment. And I am not in favor of reducing the headcount of the NYPD. I think, that's, I think it's especially now dangerous as people are scared, rightfully so, as our businesses are closing early because they don't want to leave their stores early. I mean, they don't want to leave their stores after it's dark. They don't want their employees to do it. And people aren't shopping late at night because, because they are scared. We need to make sure that um, our trans community is safe. And, and they are not. Just this year at People's Theater Project, three of our young kids came out as trans, right? Came out as gay, came out as bi. Um, three different uh, children. And that speaks to creating brave spaces where our children are able to be their full selves. So yes, it's about education. It's about expanding those spaces so they are within our school system. And that speaks to Curriculum, we need to teach queer history in our school. Our curriculum needs to reflect the communities we serve. Black history is not just a month. Latino history, it's not just a month. We need to make sure that we have culturally responsive education so that our children are able uh, to come out freely and safely, and they know that they are protected outside too. So it's about making sure we have healthcare providers who are able to meet the needs of trans people and trans New Yorkers, right? That are able to speak their language when I gave birth, thank goodness for my doula who was Latina, because believe me, I could not speak English when my baby was coming out, right? We need to make sure that we have people who are able to meet our needs, sound like us, and look like us, to make us feel safe, to push us forward, and making sure that we are decriminalizing sex work, making sure that we make sure that the, the NYPD is not accosting uh, black women, black trans women, because they think they are doing something illegal, right? We need to look at the root issues. If someone is doing sex work, why, right? If it's their choice, if it's not their choice and they have to, are we limiting? What are, and we see that there is data, right? Trans women, the same resume, two people. If someone is black and trans, they will get less job opportunities. That has to change. Abigail, what does defund the police mean to you? Um, the defund the police, defund the police means different things to different people. And that's the problem with it. To many people, it means punishing the police. And, it, and at this point, that, that, that's problematic. Um, we need to be focused on creating a new relationship with the police, one based on accountability, transparency, collaboration, and unity. I look to Camden, New Jersey. They've done some incredible things with police relations and community relations. They handled the entire summer protest last summer without anybody getting hurt. So, I, I th again, we need a new relationship with the police. And when you look to your next council person, your next council woman, you want somebody who has who can speak with co with the police, who will who has built relationships with the commanding officers. I've been to the community council precinct meetings at the 52nd, the 42nd, and the 50th. I have worked within the criminal legal system. My vision is that one day in the future we can shrink our criminal legal system and have as small legal system as possible. But in order to get there, we need to address poverty. We need to address the affordable housing crisis. We need to support our small businesses and have economic recovery so that we can decrease the things that lead to crime in the first place. So defund police means taking police off the streets. It's just plain and simple. When you look at our budget uh, for the NYPD, one third are civilian employees, two thirds are essentially patrol. Uh, if you take away, and 88% of that is personnel. So when you take away funding, defund, quite frankly, means taking cops off the street. R right now, we're not in a position to do that. And while I would like to explore some other programs, I've been pretty clear from the very beginning, even in the special election, I do not believe in defunding the police at all. Um, in many ways, we need to fund the police and, and increase the amount of training that they have. I believe that the police academy should be expanded um, and the training that they have expanded as well. We might need more money for that. In addition, I think we need to start looking at you know, the schedule of police officers. I spoke before about PTSD with officers. I, I think we need to get officers better schedules. Rather than going on the 5-4 rotation, I, I think what we really need to do is have them on the street a little bit less and in training on that week so at least they're getting a little bit of a mental health break. And I think that's very important, making sure that the job is a better job uh, for them. Um, and, and I hope that answers what, what defund means to me. Uh, 
defund the police does not mean to me does not mean to reduce the police right what it does mean <clears throat> is that we're not militarizing our police force right it means that we're not that the NYPD is not spending $86,000 on a robotic dog to go apprehend somebody um, in the New York City housing project right there is one of the biggest costs in the NYPD is overtime right we can reduce overtime by uh, you know um, implementing proper training um, and to, so that when they go out into the streets, you know, they, they have that proper interaction with, with, with civilians. But defund the police does not mean to reduce the number of cops, right? It just means to reallocate the resource, the funds that the NYPD has. is over $6 billion, right, to more social service programs so that we can reduce the number of interactions that police have with, with our civilians. I don't agree, I, I agree with you that they should not be doing traffic stops. Um, there's no such thing as a routine traffic stop, never in a million years. Um, but I do believe that the interaction that they have for nonviolent offenses should certainly be reduced. And that is what defund the police means to me. All right, thank you guys so much. We're gonna have to move on, Javier. Thanks everybody. Uh, by the way, temperature is dropping. So if you see us shaking a little <laughs> yeah. bit, it's because we're not it's scared. getting- Yeah, we're not scared We're of you not guys. scared at all, actually. <laughs> it's just that temperature is really Your becoming is a little dropping. colder no, here Even today. I'm You're cold good. up here and I never get cold. <laughs> now, housing is another big issue for the district. So that will be the topic of our next segment. Um, starting, there's a lot of focus on affordable housing. I think everyone can agree on that, but in terms of pricing, what is affordable housing these days? Nothing, if I may, right? <laughs> Nothing is affordable. Um, the biggest challenge to affordable housing right now um, is the fact that we have a, a, an AMI, right? The average, the area median income. In the Bronx, the AMI includes Rockland and Westchester County, which artificially inflates um, you know, the, the average rent, right? So they're saying that a family of four in the Bronx, according to the AMI, makes 60, about $65,000 a year. I'm a family of four. I'm barely making $40,000, right? So when developers use these AMIs to create developments, that's why we have $1,000 studios. It's ridiculous. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, in the Bronx, we pay 50% of our income. Most people pay 50% of their income in rent. And in a district where 75% of the district is renters, it, it, it just boggles the mind, right? So what we need to do is um, create a local median income, and we can do that in the city council, that takes into account the, the, the income in a, in a particular area, right? So Riverdale will have, um, you know, the, the properly uh, ranged uh, um, uh, housing, Norwood, Bedford Park, Etc. We need to re do away with the AMI, which will help people, you know, pay the proper amount uh, for rent, which is also going to help them keep money in their pocket. So I, I, I just want to like talk. The, the AMI is a factor, but understand like when when they use AMI for projects and development, they use per, they could use a percentage of it. So it could be ten percent of AMI, it could be thirty percent of AMI. But the real problem with Those it is how- Those percentages don't work. I'm sorry. No, no, they I, don't. I, I they understand. Don't. But what I'm saying is that there's flexibility in which percentage that they use. It could be 5%. It could be formerly homeless. They use a lot of different factors. The, the issue really is, is how they use the AMI and the projects that are actually funded. And, and that's what really, as council members, we need to look at. You know, HPD provides a lot of subsidies for certain projects which they must approve. And that's where city dollars are going into. And we need to look at what projects are actually getting approved. The rental housing, you know, again, the way it's come out, it's too expensive for most New Yorkers. And I think that's what, you know, you're getting at as well. You know, these rentals are too expensive. We, we can't be looking at rentals. We need to looking at more home ownership, which we spoke about before, and getting folks in into that thing. You know, and again, you know, the AMI is a factor, but it's really looking at our agencies to see where our money is going and the type of projects that we're putting it into. And that's a very big factor as council members, what we need to be doing. And, and keeping folks in their homes as well. And I'm sorry, you know, this is a really big thing as well. Subsidies, you know, providing for folks who, who are, are struggling just to get by and making sure that the city is helping those individuals. What's affordable, you know, they say typically you should be spending a third of your income. When, when folks are approved for homes, they're generally looking at about a third or 30% of your income. And that's where it should be, you know, and that's what we need to do as city council members, making sure that 
folks are, are not paying 50% because that's horrible. That's when we get into bad situations. Um, and if we have to subsidize it for folks, then, then let's do that and look at ways to do it. As a social worker, I saw the impact of the affordable housing crisis every day when I was in the field and, and working. I, I had clients who were choosing, making very difficult decisions because they needed to keep a roof over their head. And I know, again, in order to create a city that is just and equitable for all of us, we need to get a handle on the affordable housing crisis. I have a three-pronged approach to address the affordable housing crisis, starting with homeless prevention, um, starting with expanding the vouchers so that people who are ready to leave the homeless shelter can actually have a voucher that's worth that will actually get them an apartment. Um, I'm happy that that was passed, I think, last week or, or a week ago. So now the vouchers are closer to 1,900 and 2,000, whereas before they were 12,000. Um, we need to create more housing that people can actually afford to live in. One thing that I'm very excited right now is about the empty office space and the empty hotels in Manhattan. When we talk about development, when we talk about building more affordable housing or any housing, we need to look at the infrastructure of the neighborhood. We need to look at transit rich neighborhoods. We need to look at if there's room in schools, room in hospitals. Can the electrical grid handle it? Can the sewer handle it? The answer is yes in certain places and we need to be very responsible when we're choosing how we do development and how we create more affordable housing. And then the other, um, the other approach to affordable housing or addressing this crisis, we have to look at NYCHA. Throughout this city, NYCHA is a huge development and it has been divested in for the last 30 years and it is in disarray and we need to get it back up to par. NYCHA is where more of our older seniors, our low income seniors live. If we don't get a handle on what's happening at NYCHA, our homeless population will only increase. Housing is a human right. Punto. It's a human right, and it is unacceptable that this rent burden that we've been having and the crisis that has exacerbated during COVID is happening right now. It talks to our flaws as a society and us prioritizing New Yorkers and Bronxite. I completely agree with Marcos that AMI does not uh, meet our needs. And yes, even though there are percentages, Dan, as you said, the lowest percentage is still like $20,000. That's way too much for some people. If you're on fixed income, we're talking about even lower. We need to have at the $8,000 a year, $10,000 a year, people living on social security and fixed income. That's what we need. We also need to speak about affordable, right? We need housing that is affordable. Affordable for seniors who are retired affordable for young families, right? Starting out and you know, trying to move to a two bedroom, right? Or a one bedroom. We need affordable housing that is affordable for those coming out of the shelter system and yes to expanding housing vouchers. But as we think about the affordability level and the accessibility, um, we need to be very specific and that needs to be driven by our local income, by our zip codes. So that is something we can change at the city council and make sure that we are being very accountable to our community. If it's not meeting our needs, then it can't come in. Just to clarify, 10% of AMI project would be about $8,000. It's, it's again, how they put it into a project. And again, this is part of development, understanding development, how they do it in the city of New York. Yeah, so one of the reasons that I'm in the council and ran for the city council is because I speak of it often, my experiences as a teacher. You know, I'm 21 years old, and I see students come into my classroom with, 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 with struggling with their housing. That's, and, and it's on them, and it shouldn't be. They're in shelters, right? They're going to be evicted or they're facing eviction. And that's one of the reasons that I'm in this is because of their stories that I take with me to the city council. And the first bill that I sponsored or co-sponsored in the city council was the expanded right to counsel, which provides that free legal service to many people facing eviction. I did co-sponsor legislation, which, which looks to see, can we use some of this office space as affordable housing? And I sponsor the legislation that increases the rental voucher. All of these things help keep people in their homes. And, and we have been talking about that a lot. And these are, these are concrete, steps, concrete steps that actually help keep children and families, people in their homes. What are your thoughts on preserving uh, or expanding rent stabilization? Oh, I'm, okay. So rent stabilization, it, it's actually, it's a state law. Um, and the laws are within the state as far as supporting it. Uh, uh, on the city level, what we could do is to keep rent stabilized tenants in their homes uh, is, you know, eviction prevention for the most part, making sure that, you know, folks who are in rent stabilized apartments, which is truly affordable housing as well, um, are also staying in their homes. You know, seniors have, you know, there's a lot of seniors who are in rent stabilized properties. Um, and, and again, making sure that if they are under the threat of eviction, if they fall behind in their rent, 
that we do provide the subsidy and rent arrears for them to pay it. We're going to see that right now coming out of the pandemic. Right now, there is a moratorium in effect for any person who is affected by a COVID hardship, um, and that's going to expire at the end of August. When that expires, we're going to start seeing, you know, assuming it's not extended again, um, uh, which I don't think it will be because we're starting to see the federal dollars, which is supposed to be apportioned through the state. We have we need our agency, particularly HRA, to make sure the folks who need the money, who need that rent arrear supplement, to get that to keep folks in their rent stabilized homes uh, in general. But you know, let me just uh, just jump in really quick here. Like, yeah, sure. When we, you know, what I, and I know there's going to be some federal and state aspects to yeah. this, but when these moratoriums end, I mean, at least from what I understand, for the most part, is that that even though people have not been allowed to be evicted from apartments and such for not paying rent that rent's still accruing so Correct. once that moratorium's up it's not like hey i have to start paying rent again it's like hey i have to start paying rent plus i gotta start paying the rent for the last correct year and, and this yes. is where we need our city agency particularly hra to step up i've been saying it for a long time we need our hra to step up and make sure that the folks who need it most are, are, are getting that that subsidy so interestingly enough there was a bill um in in the state assembly uh, sponsored by yuli nu um that would uh, benefit both landlord, small landlords um, and renters in, in helping them offset this debt. Unfortunately, there was a bill, the bill that was actually passed in the assembly, uh, sponsored by our current, uh, by, by the, the assembly member of the 81st, kept this debt, right? So if as a renter, I'm having problems paying rent now, how can I then pay you $12,000, $15,000 a year later if, if we have no economic uh, activity going on. Um, there, there needs to be some reconsideration to this bill um, because there's another bill that could have passed in this place that would have taken care of both small landlords um, uh, and, and renters and by keeping them in their home. We need to cancel rent. So that was a bill that could have passed at the state level. It didn't. And unfortunately, our assembly member refused to pass it. You know, punto. And yes, it's not about punishing our landlords. Let's work with them. It's government's job to subsidize in the moment. But we can't put it on the backs of the renters. We can't put it on the backs of the tenants who have lost their job and have been living on pantries right now and collecting cans. So many of our family members who put food in the mouths of their children. Let's be very clear. What are we prioritizing? The profits? Or are we prioritizing the humanity of Bronxites and New Yorkers? So, yes, there was a bill to cancel rent. Unfortunately, we didn't pass it. So now it's up to us. How are we standing up for our tenants? How are we standing up for our families? So because we can't burden them as we come back with $12,000 in debt and getting evicted. That is unacceptable. But what are the landlords supposed to do? I mean, you know, not all landlords are like these large corporations. That is Some very true. Some landlords are people who just, you know, who are families who own a couple of you yep. know, places well, and they rent them out. What are they supposed to do with that? We the need to bail them out. We need to support them. Right. So one thing we are not talking about the big slum lords. Right. That is one conversation that we need to have. And we need to figure out they can. You know, we bailed out Wall Street once before we saw how that turned out. Right. That's not the conversation. And there's a lot of actually Bangladeshi families, immigrant families uh, who buy their house and rent it out. Right. So they need we need to stop unfair inspections for them. We need to make sure that we are supporting them as we're supporting this you know, with their mortgage. Right. So what is the role of government? And it's nuanced. But at the end of the day, we cannot burden our families as we come out of this crisis with having to pay back. Those who can and have been able to pay rent, great. But we're talking about a number of people and families who have not been able to. And it is unfair to start off with that pay. So the, the problem with cancel rent is just the effect it would have on both the city economy and state economy, because it's not just about landlords that rely on the system. It's all of the other businesses and, and quite frankly, the taxes that are underneath it that support much more than, than just the owner. So that's why, again, when it comes down to you know, HRA, for me, it's if anybody has rent arrears and they can't afford to pay it back, we as council members and we as a city meet, need to step up and support those folks. But we have to be cognizant and realistic uh, uh, if we're going to be a council member to understand the overall city economy and, and who relies on all of the different businesses that are there. Y y there's, again, superintendents, there's hardware stores, there, there's cleaning supply companies, there's a, a whole industry that goes underneath it that supports you know, a lot of the residential buildings that we live in. So that's why, for me, I believe help those in need, make sure the city subsidizes it and the state gets them the money. Michael, just to be clear, the bill that wasn't passed in the assembly by, um, sponsored by Yulene, would have actually taken care of small 
uh, landlords and making sure that they would have recouped whatever they lost. And it's a it's a shame that that bill did not make it past the to the floor for a vote. You know, while we're talking about affordability and housing, you know, I just have to ask you a question. So, you know, you're such a passionate activist, right? And we're talking about the affordability. But in your in Inwood, I've been contacted by the activists who fought the upzoning of Inwood, fought it really hard, got arrested, did marches, rallies. You're always the one who's fighting for the poorest New Yorkers, yet you supported this plan that's going to displace thousands of immigrants, thousands of residents that's going to hurt the small businesses. I think it's really important for us in this district to understand what happened there and, and to let us know, is that going to happen to us? So as the executive director of an organization, one of the most successful arts organizations in Upper Manhattan, I was uh, tasked with leading the arts and culture component of this holistic rezoning. Some of my counterparts, leaders in housing, were doing housing, small businesses, uh, a, and other areas, right? Over three years, we worked with the community. We presented a community-driven project, one that addressed the needs of our community. But and to be frank, the day it. that it was announced, that the plan that was presented did not match. And that taught me a lot of things. I learned a lot from that experience because it made very clear that we can be organized as a society, as a community. We can be vocal and we can be strong, but that's not enough. We need to have a council member. We need to have a representative who is grounded on values, who listens to the community. I and, absolutely you know, agree with you. And that's exactly I think that's it's one so of the important. reasons why I'm running for office. But the community, That's exactly one of the reasons why I'm running for office. The community board opposed it. The activists in Inwood have opposed it. As I said before, there was a zealous, there's a lawsuit. And, and you, from the beginning, yeah. were there on stage trying to push this program. And I think we, that is as, untrue. I think it's important for us. It is true. I mean, you are on, on, you are on TV with your Donis Rodriguez. You are in articles as quoted being supported. This upzoning. This is going to displace thousands. So one of, of the things how things work, uh, Abigail, when it comes to rezonings, right? The city had a plan and the city council. They said that the neighborhood was gonna be upzoned. And it is my job as an executive director who works with a thousand kids, many of them from Washington Heights, you know, half of them from the Bronx, but many of them up there in our offices there to make sure that we are able to advocate to make it the most fair and just plan. That is the job of leaders. I don't right? think At there the was end, I would have not voted for that plan. There was, you know, and it's staying back is not an option. But Staying you, you, back is not an option. You, you literally stood shoulder to shoulder with Hidani's um, and applauded. This is a quote. You applauded the introduction of a theater component um, in, in this rezoning um, and that gentrification was inevitable, right? It is inevitable. But for me, it's tough to swallow um, that on one end, you... You know, you stood fast with, with this development. You applauded it. You supported it. Um, your, your, your organization is benefiting from, from a space. Your organization is benefiting from a space. From has space? also the, the theater space that was going to no be. There's no theater space. It will. Th but, there will be, you know. Um, in addition to that, your organization has also benefited from a little over $500,000 um, and funding from Idani's, the, the prime sponsor that's going to displace thousands of people in So Inwood. if you look at the public records, Marcos, my funding was slashed in half after the rezoning because I was not shoulder to shoulder. And I spoke. It is very important to be very clear here. There is You're no right. theater. Right. And as arts and culture sector, we did fight hard. We had meetings every month for over three years. And this rezoning, the first in the city, included arts and culture. There will be an arts and culture owned by the Department of Cultural Affairs. It'll we, be owned by the city of New York so, with no other money included. So, so I just want to- So who's the prime, who's, who's benefiting, right? Nobody's you, benefiting, you the community the is benefiting company. from that, but they are not benefiting from the zoning because we need to make sure to pass racial impact. We need to make sure to look at schools and you, none of that will happen. We only and have a few seconds so, in, we only have a few seconds. So, uh, you know, I want to jump in our final segment and, uh, you know, and, and this is, and, and we, 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 we're calling this civics, but, um, you know, but there's a very important question. Anybody who reads the Riverdale Press understands, you know, they see this a lot. You know, we had something like, what was it? $260,000 has already been spent, at least as of, you know, as of the reporting yesterday or Friday on this race alone. Um, I think something like 
you know, 13% of that somehow ended up back in the Bronx. Eric, you were the worst offender of this. I think 2% of your spending was here where like most of it was in. I mean, how does that, how is that an example of setting about reinvesting back in the Bronx if your own campaigns can't reinvest back in the Bronx? Well, let's be clear. The program is designed to empower small dollar donors and to incentivize candidates like us to talk to people. Ideally, it would be in the district, but it's really people in the city. And I am proud to be the candidate who actually campaigned for that in 2018. And if anyone would like to go to the voter guide from 2018 and read what I wrote then, it's the same as I'm saying now, empowering small dollar donors, limiting how much money could be contributed to a single candidate in the race. That's a record I'm very proud of. Well, you and don't believe money, in reinvesting that on. back in the Bronx. I, I mean, that's collecting the money, but what about spending the and money? The, no, I understand. And, perhaps, and there's always ways to go back to programs and improve them. And if you believe that there should be an incentive for candidates to go back and reinvest the money on businesses in the Bronx, love to chat with you about it. But my campaign spends its money on direct voter contact to talk with as many people in the district as possible. That is almost every single dollar I spend is spent getting my message out and talking to people and communicating with them in multiple languages throughout the entire district. That is how we spend our money. I am so proud to have run two back-to-back -back, uh, city council campaigns and with the most donors out of anybody of my competitors here uh, running for city council, right? We are endorsed by Working Families Party because we are grassroots and people-centered. And I am proud that in the special, we spent the most money right here in the Bronx because I, did, I believe in economic democracy. So how I campaign is how I govern, right? And we do voter contact every single day, but we've hired local organizers. Our organizers are from from Norwood, from Bedford Park, from Spite and Dival, from Riverdale, and from Kingsbridge. Born and raised, well, some immigrated, but we're all here. So we've invested most of the money also on voter contact, but on hiring local, right? We haven't worked with any consultants. We've done print on, uh, union printing and then hired local people. And that's exactly what investing in our community is. The Bronx is powerful. The Bronx is strong and we have brilliance right here. And we're showing that with our campaign. And I think it's essential. I uh, agree. Said, and I've hired, I've also hired from the community canvassers. And Michael, you and I have had I think more than one conversation about this. And when I, and it troubles me that you've written maybe seven articles about this and haven't asked candidates for quotes for context. When you and I spoke about this, I told you that when I was exploring running for this campaign, one of the pieces of advice that I got from multiple people on the inside was, do not trust any printers in the Bronx. The Bronx machine has fingers in all of them. You have to go outside. And everybody knows that a, a bulk of a candidate's expenditures is often in printing. And so that's what we did. So we went outside for, outside of the borough for printing, but we prioritized other things. We prioritized LGBTQ and BIPOC minority-owned businesses when, when we did go outside of the Bronx. But Abigail, but, I, Abigail, but I mean, just, you know, just to kind of follow up with that on that, I mean, but how is it that you could only spend maybe a couple thousand dollars where like Mino's campaign, they spent $26,000. Well, Mino's campaign manager didn't cash his check yet for, for this month. And I don't think that he lives in this district. And if, and you know, my, I told you, six. I told you that my campaign manager does, but she like so many people has her permanent address at her mom's house in Illinois, but I told you she lives in this district and you didn't print that. And if you had printed that, then my percentages would be significantly higher. So I think it's really important. I agree with you. Spending money in district is absolutely important, but let's be accurate about what's actually happening here. I, we talked about this. So I think I'd like uh, to, I kind of, cause it's relevant to what yeah. you said. I just want to add one thing and which you also, I don't mean to, to gang up, but it's also true that I, I actually did in the last campaign, invest money. We we took out ads on the Riverdale Press. Yes, but web. you did that we through it. But you did that took, through a Brooklyn consulting firm, which we, we cannot we took, track. But you received the check. But it's not. But there's transparency aspects. So of that. Go we ahead, spent. Dan. Well, Go ahead. I know Thank you don't you, like Eric. to hear this, Thank but you. we spent money no, on the Eric. Riverdale Press website. I've stated it's that. a difficult I've thing to hear, ahead. but it's the truth. So uh, just a fact. I think on the special, I, I spent the most in the Bronx. Um, in the special election, I, I will say this. You know, running a campaign is difficult. And, and finding folks that, you know, are, are best and in tune with your, you know, your, your thought process and running a campaign, you know, sometimes you can't always uh, choose directly from the Bronx. I can tell you, I've been a local business owner here for 20 years. If I can invest in this area, I will. Uh, campaigns are a tricky thing for a, a number of different reasons. Um, I try to spend the, the, the money, especially since it's campaign finance, as much as I can within the city of New York. 
Um, if I have to go, uh, if I can do in district, definitely. Um, I have advertised in, in local papers, um, not, not just the Riverdale Press, but others. Um, it's important, but I, I think with campaigns in general, it's such a, a niche process in New York. Um, it's understandable that you do have to go outside of the district for it. My, if I may just close it out, right? My challenge is I couldn't get any printers um, to, to work with me here yeah, in the Bronx, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it, you know, to me is... Um, Same thing with attorneys. Ulterior, they were all conflicted right? out. Thanks, machine. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, right? I, I actually... I was telling someone today, I, I actually had a printer tell me um, they were told not to work with me. I, and, it's, and it's really unfortunate. Um, so most of my money... What you know, the, the the printing that I had done is out of Queens, but my staff and staffing and canvassing and all of the uh, the people, right? The ground troops are all from Norwood, um, Kingsbridge, and Bedford Park, right? So I kept as much money locally as I as, as I could. Well, we also were we're facing ranked choice voting. Uh, this is actually the second time for this race. Um, Abigail and Marcus is actually new for you guys. You weren't in the special election, but um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about after the first few special election races, where, like for instance, uh, it seemed that all of the preliminary numbers ended up being how it how it shook out, even with ranked choice voting. So I have some wondering: is it is it worth doing that? What are your thoughts on ranked choice voting? Is it something that needs to be given time? Is it something that maybe? you know, is more kind of a, a smoke screen of like, hey, look, we're doing something, but not. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I I agree. Um, it's something that's brand new. And and as with all new things, it takes a, a little while, right, to, to, to learn how it works. Um, you know, people are still voting the way they used to vote. Voting, voting, um, the way people vote, voting behavior is, is almost like uh, intrinsic, right? You just go, you vote down the line, and then you go, and people have been voting like that forever so now we've we've changed the rules of the game and we've given them the opportunity to to rank more than one person which i personally appreciate right because winning a a race with a plurality vote is not in my opinion a real win because it doesn't reflect the true decision of the entire district right it's only a, a small percentage um and i wasn't an rcv fan um, it was only until I, you know, went to a training and understood how the dynamics of um, of ranked choice voting works and how it brings in a true majority, excuse me, a true majority win, which is what we need, right? Too many races have been won, especially here in the Bronx, which has led to, you know, dynastic policies, uh, dynastic politics, um, by very small margins. And ranked choice voting is now opening that up and changing that. It's going to take a little while. Um, there's some aspects of the uh, of, of this new system that have been uh, manipulated, as we saw um, out in Queens. Um, but I believe in it's a new system that's going to work and bring a true majority um, and end dynastic politics that we have. Um, so uh, I couldn't help but think that you're referring to me. Uh, I mean, when you say, when you say so fits. just to be clear, like I'm supportive of ranked choice voting. I've tried, you know, and I've been outspoken in the need to educate New Yorkers in multiple means. And what does that mean? It means multiple languages. It means something besides Zoom, which leaves out very often communities of color and older adults. And so when I'm talking about reforms to ranked choice voting, it means making sure that everyone gets that outreach, whether it's advertisements on where people go, whether it's putting uh, information in the Meals on Wheels and the food deliveries that people get. And of course, I'm, you know, I'm proud to have been you know, advocating for the approval of the software that allows that counting to take place. And the State Board of Elections announced that they're doing it. But to be clear, just to reference what you said, I got more than double the first place votes of the second place candidate. And I won overwhelmingly the election. With 10% of the voter turnout. Well, and just so to be clear be on clear. my right. Well, let's, let's be, be clear, clear about on I'll, who's. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to be clear that while you're, you know, um, spewing these numbers of percentages of, you know, more than any other, you know, previous election, we have to keep in mind that the number of the percentage of voters that came out was only 10% of the total number of registered voters. So there's going to be a significantly higher number of voter turnout um, in this primary, and I'm not sure if the numbers that you're, you're, you're touting will hold. Well let's, let, well, let's just be clear on our records on turning out people to vote. I am the candidate here who has worked for years, for years to advocate for things like early voting. This last election, we were able to double the number of early voting sites 
in the district, right? I was an advocate to make sure that mail-in voting was expanded. I have been doing work for years to try to make it easier to vote and expand the number of people who vote. I think any election with less than 100% turnout is a low turnout election. But again, these numbers I'm using are relevant because this past election, we brought out almost 10,000 people and you could say 10%, fine. However, it is high. Saying, it's you fact. literally said 10%. Okay. So, and that is, again, higher than other elections, many other elections that we've had in this district and throughout the city. And that's nothing that, and we mm -hmm. should not be proud of that. And we I'm, should not, um, we should not be proud of that. We should not use that as a badge of glory because it's still an extremely low number of voters. And it's something historically in the Bronx that is a problem for us, getting folks to come out and vote. So we shouldn't be applauding that 10,000 people came out or less than 10,000 because it's not a good number. So l let's not do that. I don't um, think it's a good I number. Do, well, good. What then I'm we're saying, in agreement. Okay, we're but what agreement. I'm saying to you is that there's one person so, here who's actively done work but so for years I. to so try to make voting and, and easier. I from Marcos and, get people and, and out Abigail to vote. and Mino, but so have I. So that doesn't distinguish you from anyone. We, we've all advocated for those things in many respects. Mino, get I the think, last word. Go ahead, Mino. Yeah. Go ahead with the last so, word. So, voter, we need to make sure that uh, this is going to take time. I agree with Marcos, right? I think a ranked choice voting is great. We're going to see it. Other cities have been doing it for a while. We're going to really see the impacts of it in a couple of years. We need to make sure to be educating. But I think when it talks about civic engagement, right? Because the question was about civics, right? How are we expanding civic engagement? How are we making voters more um, educated? So we need to be bringing it into schools. We need to right now, I re think we really need to look at the closed primary. We need to make sure that voters are able to vote and understand municipal elections versus state elections versus general elections. So many people vote for president and are not very clear on the importance of primaries, right? So I think it's as we're educating, that's going to be key for me as councilwoman, civic engagement and engaging municipal voting rights so that those of us who are in green cards, those of, our living, li those of us living here with work visas and dreamers can vote too because this is our home. This is all of our homes. Well, and the president of the United States is not going to fix our sidewalk, but we are, right? <laughs> council, council members are. And, and high schoolers need to know that. Thank you, Abigail. So Javier, I solved civics. There you go. We've, we've solved it all. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today for this Primary Candidates Forum. Remember, early voting runs through June 20th. If you rather wait and vote on primary day, that happens on June 22nd. And if you don't know where your polling site is, check out findmypollsite.vote.nyc. Or if you're a bit old school like me, you can call 866-VOTE-NYC. We do want to give a special thank you uh, to the James Baldwin Outdoor Learning Center for hosting us today. And uh, at least on behalf of the Riverdale Press, I want to personally thank all the amazing people at BronxNet for, partner, par for partnering with us and, uh, and being such a fantastic community resource, helping us explore local voices, or ensure local voices and local issues are heard. Thank you, Michael. I also thank the production team at BronxNet, Executive Director Michael Max Nobby, Creative Director uh, Walter Garaikoa, and uh, also everyone who has made this forum possible. I don't think everybody realizes how many people are involved behind all the, behind the scenes here. Uh, the Riverdale Press has served the Northwest Bronx for more than 70 years, uh, and it's true hyperlocal journalism in a time when we all need it most. You can read our stories and find out how you can subscribe at RiverdalePress.com. Also, tune in to BronxNet for up-to-date community and public affairs from a very local perspective. You can't get anywhere else on television. Please spread the word and share this program with others. And please make sure to get up to vote on or June 22nd. And also in the upcoming New York City general election on Tuesday, November 2nd. Good day. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.